the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is the first time we've looked at this book together. I confess, frankly, it's the first time I've looked at it with a congregation. So it's as new to me as it is to you, except for the private reading that you've done. How many of you have ever heard a series of sermons on Ecclesiastes? Let's see. One, two, three of you. Good. Well, again, we're breaking fresh ground as we were this morning. Incidentally, for those of you who have the same problem that Daniel has on Sunday mornings, lions, particularly, <laughs> you know what I mean by that? I mean the lions in bed. Um, you really do need to be here on Sunday morning if you want to get a balanced diet. And in fact, though I didn't realize it at the time, now that I've started preparing Colossians and Ecclesiastes, the remarkable way they complement each other is incredible. They just belong together. And what Ecclesiastes doesn't answer, Colossians does. So I hope that some of you may be able to fight that lion and come on Sunday mornings. Now the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to read the first 11 verses and then I'm going to give you more an introductory study tonight so that you can help to read the book for yourself, just supposing there are those here who can't come back for more. Chapter 1, these are the words of the philosopher, David's son, who was king in Jerusalem. It is useless. Useless, said the philosopher. Life is useless, all useless. You spend your life working, laboring, and what do you have to show for it? Generations come and generations go, but the world stays just the same. The sun still rises and it still goes down, going wearily back to where it must start all over again. The wind blows south, the wind blows north, round and round and back again. Every river flows into the sea, but the sea is not yet full. The water returns to where the rivers began and starts all over again. Everything leads to weariness. A weariness too great for words. Our eyes can never see enough to be satisfied. Our ears can never hear enough. What has happened before will happen again. What has been done before will be done again. There's nothing new in the whole world. Look, they say, here's something new, but no. It has all happened before, long before we were born. No one remembers what has happened in the past, and no one in days to come will remember what happens between now and then. Well, on Sunday evenings for the next three months, we're going to study what many have called the strangest book in the Bible. Have you seen this pink sheet? There were 21 statements that I put on that sheet from the book of Ecclesiastes. And the sheet that has been returned to me with some very intriguing comments ticked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 out of 21 as agreeable to the person who filled that in. How many of you agreed with all 21 statements? Hmm, so none of you agree with God's word. How many of you agree with, say, 15? 10. One agrees with 10 or more. How many agree with 5 or more? How many agree with none? <laughs> One. <laughs> When you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, your first reaction is, what on earth is that book doing in the Bible? Did you have that reaction? It seems to put an emphasis on fate rather than faith, on happiness rather than holiness, on this world rather than the next, on things material rather than things spiritual. It's an odd sort of book. 
some find it depressing rather than inspiring and go away really feeling down in the mouth after reading this writer. Life is useless, utterly useless, all useless. And that's where he begins. It's not quite where he ends, but it's where he begins. And there have been those who say, you know, this isn't Bible teaching at all. This has more in common with either ancient Greek Stoicism or Oriental Buddhism or even modern existentialism, but it's not the truth of God. This is not how God talks. It doesn't fit. It doesn't quote the prophets, for example, and the rest of the Bible, and it is nowhere quoted in the New Testament, and so some people have said it shouldn't be there at all. Funnily enough, when the Jews put the Old Testament together and when the Christians put the whole Bible together, neither group had any doubts that this book should be in. So if we have doubts, we've got to ask if there may be something wrong with us and if we may have missed the point of this book. To others, it seems as if it's a statement of utter despair. I read another book, not this one, and not part of the Bible this week, and I came across this sentence in it. Nature has let us down. God has taken the receiver off the hook and time is running out. Boy, that's a depressing statement if ever there was one. And it seemed to me to be very much of a piece with Ecclesiastes. Or there was a comedian on television this week who said, death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. Now, that kind of sick humor, that kind of black humor, is very close to some of the things this man says. He says, for example, remember that no matter how long you live, you will be dead much longer. Now, that's the same kind of sick humor. Well, what place has it in the Word of God? What's it doing there? Well, I want to begin by saying that this was written by a man who used his brain box. It was written by a man prepared to think. Who was it said the greatest unexplored territory is right underneath your hat? Meaning that most of us never stop to think. We're a bit like the American who jumped into a taxi outside King's Cross Station and said, drive on, drive on. And the driver said, where to? He said, I haven't time to consider such questions. Drive on. Now that may sound utterly silly to you, but it's what the majority of people in Britain are doing right now getting nowhere fast and never stopping to ask the basic questions and the basic questions always begin with why not how people ask how can I be happy how can I make a living how can I get guidance how can I do this they should be asking why should I make a living why should I need guidance why and all the big questions in life begin with why, not how. Science answers the question how again and again, but it never answers the question why. It may be able to tell us how the world began, but it doesn't tell us why. And it's the why that is important. And this book is a book that isn't here to tell you how, it's a book to tell you why. And that's a much more important question. And the man who wrote this book was a man who sat down and thought about life. He was an older man and he's looking back over a lifetime spent searching for the answers and a lifetime in which he's failed to find them. And he says, I set out in life to find out what life is all about. Here is the big question which is being asked in this whole book. Is life worth living? That's the question. Is life worth living? The crude and silly answer to that is it depends on the liver, said someone, in more senses than one. Your health is everything. But it isn't, even if you have your health and your liver is in order. Why live? I remember somebody being asked, why are you working like that? Well, I'm working like this to get money. Why? Well, you've got to live. Why? The man had no answer. And there he was working every day to get a living, to live. And he'd never asked, why? Why bother to keep going? Why work just to go on working? Why get up and go to work and come home and get your tea and put your feet up and go to bed and get up and go to work and get, come home, get your tea, put your feet up, go to bed, get up the next morning, go to work? Why? Is it worth it? What do you have to show for it at the end? That is the question. 
And he asks here, what profit is there to a man who's worked hard all his life? What does he have to show for it at the end? What is there left at the end of life? Because it's what's left at the end of the day that is profit. And you know, not only did this man ask the question, but Jesus asked it, what shall it profit a man when he gets to the end of the day and adds up the books? Will it be profit or loss? That's the question. Is life worth living? And you know, this book is written by an old man, but it's written to the third of this congregation between the age of 15 and 25. Here is an old man pleading with young people all the way through, find the answer at the beginning of your life. Don't wait till you get to my age. Think through these cul-de-sacs before you go down them. Find out where life is meant to lead before you discover that you've wasted your years going up a cul-de-sac. That's what he's saying. And at the end of the book, he makes an impassioned plea to young people. He says, before your hair is as gray as mine is, before you're doddery, before you're elderly, before you're senile, get the answers to these questions. This reminded me of again, again of that man who joined my grandfather's church, an old man with a beard who came to every mortal thing in the church, Sunday services, Sunday school, women's meeting, men's meeting, boy scouts, girl guides, the lot. And this was so embarrassing, my grandfather was told to go to him and find out why and stop him. And my grandfather went and said, why do you come to everything? You don't need to come to it all. Come to the services, come to the prayer meeting, but why do you come to all the meetings? And he said, because I only became a Christian when I was 67 years of age and I'm trying to catch up on lost time. And that's not funny. It's tragic. And there are many people who've only started asking the right questions after they've discovered all the cul-de-sacs. And we are going to go on this search with this man, and one of the things I like about him is his absolute honesty. He tells us he tried this, he tried that, he tried the other. All the things that people are trying today. We will not learn. We will go through the hard school of experience whose colors are black and blue. We will go through it. We say to the older generation, we've nothing to learn from you, and we go and learn the same lessons they had to learn the hard way. We find out that the things we thought promised life are literally dead ends. And praise God for somebody in the Bible who is honest enough to write it down in old age and say, I've tried it. You name it, I've tried it. And I didn't find the meaning of life. And life was not worth living even though I tried it. So it's got something to say. To put it in a nutshell, Ecclesiastes asks all the right questions, but it comes up with the wrong answers, and that's why you disagree with some of its statements. He asks the right questions, but he comes up with the wrong answers. And I want to ask this question, why, in view of the fact that he asked the right questions, did he come up with the wrong answers? The answer to my question is fairly simple. He decided to look for the meaning of life within two very distinct limits. And once you put those limits on life, you condemn yourself to finding the wrong answers. First of all, he put a limit in space on his search. He looked for the meaning of life under the sun. And that's a key phrase, and it occurs 28 times in this short book of 12 chapters. Under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. He said, I've tried everything under the sun. And you still use that phrase, don't you? He says, I've looked everywhere under the sun. And this was why he came up with the wrong answers, because once you say under the sun, you've shut yourself off from the answer to your question as to the meaning of life. You see, the phrase under the sun means everything within our observable world. Everything that we can see at ground level. Everything in the sphere in which we live and move. And once you say, I'm going to look for the meaning of life under the sun, you condemn yourself to saying life is pointless, useless. It's not worth living. And this man is being absolutely honest that those who live under the sun, whose highest ambition is to get a suntan, 
will find out that it's a dead end and that that way does not bring the meaning of life. Living under the sun, looking everywhere under the sun, doing anything under the sun, you will fail to find a purpose to life. Now the second limitation that he imposed on his own search was this. It was a limitation in time, not only limited in space from earth to the sun. In other words, he was going to find it here, somewhere in this observable universe. He also put a limit on time. And another key phrase that comes in again and again is, as long as I live. And this man had no concept of life after death. Time and again he asked the question, who can tell me what will happen to me when I die? Nobody, there's no answer to that. And therefore he says, I've got to find the meaning of life in this life. I've got to find the answers in this life. Now these two limits, under the sun and while I live, prevented him from ever coming up with the right answers. And this book is saying loud and clear, and God wanted it in the Bible. It is saying if you are secular men, if you are humanist men, if you are bounded in time and space by what you can observe and by how long you live, you can only come at the end of the day to one conclusion. Life is useless. If you are honest with yourself at the end of the day, you will say it has been pointless. It has been a waste of time. Now that's an honest statement. And praise God, God begins where we are and the Bible begins where you are. And what I'm saying now may be precisely what you think. Especially if you're an older person. You are beginning to be disappointed and disillusioned. You set out as this man did with high hopes that life would fulfill its promise. Life was full of promise. You built your castles in the air and you finished up with a bungalow at Bournemouth. And you're disillusioned and you wonder how long you'll be fit enough to dig the garden of it. Do you see the feel? Can you get the feel, the guts of the man as he honestly says, I set out like you. I was going to live life to the full. I tried pleasure, I tried money, I tried fame, I tried education, I tried everything. And I finish up a disillusioned, disappointed man who says, I have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. I have no profit in the accounts of life. I have nothing left now that my little day is over. Now there's honesty for you if you like. You don't need to go outside the Bible to find humanism and secularism portrayed in utter stark honesty. Now there is this one difference. Though he does say utterly frankly, I do not know the answer to the questions of life. I don't understand life. I cannot tell you why it's worth living. Yet nevertheless, he is not an agnostic, he's not an atheist, because he was a Jew. And as a Jew, he knew that there was a God. He doesn't argue for the existence of God. Like the Bible as a whole, he assumes there's a God. And the word God comes in now and again. And people say, well, surely he's reaching above the sun there. No, he isn't. He says God is above the sun. And I'm sure that God must have the answer to these questions, but he's not answering. And he's not told me the secret, so I can't tell you. He says, I believe in the long run it must be better to fear God, but I can't tell you why. I believe it must pay to be good, but he said, all the facts of life tell me that it doesn't. And through this book, there's a tension in this man between the faith he was brought up to believe as a Jewish boy that there is a God and that that God is just and fair and that to God life does matter and that there is a meaning to life he had to say, well, he has not told me. I've had to search for myself, and I have not found. And I just don't know. And on that basis, he said, I'm going to give you young people some advice as to how to cope with a world that you don't understand. How to make something of a life whose meaning eludes you. And you know, if that was all I had to preach to you, I don't think I'd bother to preach it. But every Sunday evening we look into this book, I'm going to finish up by showing you how our Lord Jesus Christ both contrasts with and complements this man. 
and takes his questions and answers them and takes his longings and fulfills them and takes his dreams and makes them come true. And you need to go through Ecclesiastes to find Christ. You need to go through some kind of experience in which you say, I, I just see it all as pointless. I can't find meaning. I can't find life. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not satisfied. You need to go through that to hear Christ say, this is life. This is life. To find out that it's all worthwhile after all and that there's tremendous purpose and meaning in it. As one person has said, there lies more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. Have you heard that little phrase? I think it's true. Now, I want to say just a little about the writer. I'm not going to go into all that the scholars say as to whether it's Solomon or not. His name certainly never occurs in the book. But he does describe himself as a son of David and the king of Israel living in Jerusalem. I'll maybe come back to that question, was this Solomon or was it not? But he does give himself a title. It's a very unusual one, Koheleth, which means uh, originally it meant an audience or a congregation or an assembly, and then it came to mean the man who gathered them together, and then it came to mean the speaker who was able to gather an audience, and then it came to mean the lecturer or the professor, and thus the philosopher. And in fact, that's the translation that has been chosen in the Good News Bible, the philosopher. And a philosopher is a man who likes the answers. Philo means I love, and, and the Sophie part comes from Sophia, wisdom. I like to know. He's a man who wants answers from life. He wants to ans ask the questions, and he wants an answer. And I praise him for this. Far too many people go right through life without ever asking the right questions. And that's why they never find Jesus Christ. They don't ask. And even if they expressed honest doubt, they might get through to Jesus, but they don't. But let me build up an identical picture of this man's character, if I can, from the book. First of all, I've said he's an old man. That's quite clear. He's a doddery old man, and he knows it. And he speaks from almost a wheelchair. He's speaking to young people from the vantage point of someone who's seen it all and been around every corner. Secondly, he's not only an older man, he's an educated man. He is in fact upper class, if we can say that, from the background from which he speaks. He's had all the money he's needed to do anything. He's had all the education he could have asked for. This man is a very observant man. He watches life carefully. He observes and he's a very detached observer. He's not prejudiced. He looks at a human situation and he says, you know, this is the fact However much it contradicts my faith, there's the fact. He's an observant man. He's a godly man. He believes there is a God, and he doesn't argue the point. He can't fit that faith into the facts, but he believes there's a God. He's an honest man. I've said that already. He's a hard-working man. I get the impression of a dynamic, energetic character. Whatever he did, he did it to the hilt. He did things not in half measures. He went the whole hog. Whatever he tried, he went the whole way. So a real exciting character. I find here a respected man who is looked to, to give advice to younger people. And I find a man who's willing to teach from his experience. Now let's look at verses 1 to 11. It's a very pessimistic beginning. He states the conclusion that he's come to in answer to the big question, is life worth living? He states his answer and then he begins to tell us why he's come to that conclusion. And his conclusion is life is useless. The older versions of the Bible had the word vanity. But that word has begun to lose its meaning. It's a word meaning emptiness, hollow. The literal Hebrew word means a breath, a wisp of breath. That's a very good description of life, isn't it? You begin to breathe and then you cease. Life is just a breath. It's gone. It's almost the description of going out on a cold winter's morning and seeing your breath come out of your mouth and you see it come out and then very quickly it disperses and disappears. Life is just a breath. It's gone. Or perhaps another translation would be life is just a bubble. A bubble is just a lump of air. And you try and grasp it, 
It looks so beautiful, it's got color, and you try and grasp it and you're left with nothing. Christina Rossetti wrote this little verse of a poem, Our face is set like flint against our trouble, yet many things there are which comfort us. This bubble is a rainbow-colored bubble, this bubble life tumultuous. Just a bubble. Now, anybody who feels that life is just a bubble ought to read this book. Here's a man who said, it's just a bubble. It was a, a rainbow-colored bubble, and I grasped it, and I found it was just a bit of air. Nothingness. Frankly, if I'd been translating the Good News Bible, I would have said this. Life is pointless. Pointless. That's the real flavor of what he's saying here. It's pointless. You have nothing to show for it at the end. You have nothing left at the end of the day. The moment you die, you draw a line under the accounts and you say, now what have I got left that I can keep? Because that's your profit. What have I got left that I can keep? And the answer is nothing. And I've worked so hard and I've been so busy. It's so pointless. Now what a conclusion. And yet he's writing as an older man. And he says, why have I come to that conclusion? I've come to that conclusion because, he said, everything I see is rushing in circles and getting nowhere. Everything. That's what I've done. He said, life for me has been a treadmill or a roundabout. For some, life is like a roundabout. They get on, they have a great time while they're on. They go round and round and round and they get off just where they got on. They've lost their money. For others, life isn't a roundabout, it's a treadmill. You get in and you go round and round and round and you tread your way to the office and back and it's just a treadmill. But you get off just where you got on. And generations come and generations go, but the world stays just the same. It was there before you came and it will be there after you've gone. Is this not facing facts? Is this not being utterly honest? And you will have nothing... Ah, but someone will say, and people do say this, they've said it to me, I hope to leave the world a little better than I found it. I hope to leave something for those who come after me. Have you heard that? That's the hope that keeps many people going. They know that when they get to the end of the road, they have nothing to take from this world. Naked they came into it, naked they go out, so they hope to leave something for the people who follow on. Ah, says this man, face life honestly. Do you think you'll be remembered? And for how long? Do you think your little life will really make much difference to this world? Not a bit of it. You have no impression whatever on it. It will carry on without you. The seasons will come and the seasons will go. People will be born and people will die. The world goes on just the same as if you'd never been on it. Hard talking, yes, but it's making people face facts. It's taking them to the logical conclusion of their own thinking. If you have hopes that you're going to leave this world a much happier, better place than you found it, then think again. It'll have just as much war and just as much famine, if not more, after you've gone than before you came. So if you think you're going to change the world, he says, think again. That's not the meaning of life. He said, individual lives are like a piece of paper just thrown into the river, drifting down and then gradually disintegrating and sinking to the bottom, and the river goes on flowing just as it did before. He says, look not only at human life. People are born and die. There was a 90-year-old Christian doctor up in Whitby in Yorkshire, and he was invited to speak to a youth club in which there were some very with it youngsters and he gave them a talk for a half an hour on his faith at 90 years of age and a young girl in a miniskirt got up and said Dr. Vines you're old fashioned you're old fashioned and he said my dear young lady you came into the world in an old fashioned way and you'll go out of it an old fashioned way and that's what he's saying here there's nothing new look at nature as distinct from human beings look at nature the sun, it starts, let's get orientated, it starts in the east, goes round to the west, then it hurries round underneath to get up in the morning, <laughs> come round, then it hurries round underneath and gets up in the morning, just like you. Of course, his 
astronomy may have been a bit astray, but his observed facts were perfectly correct. And he didn't know about evaporation in those days, but he said all the rivers go into the sea and the sea's not full, it doesn't overflow. And somehow the water gets back to the beginning and it flows all over again into the sea, back, back, round, round, just like me, getting up to go to work and going back to bed. Or look at the wind. The weather forecaster says it's southwest today and then it's northeast and then it's southeast and then it's northwest and it just goes round and round and round and round in circles. The same amount of air just going round in circles, getting nowhere. Indeed, the whole universe we now know is like this. We're all going in circles, getting nowhere fast. You're moving at 19 miles a second in this moment. Can you feel it? You would if uh, the Lord accelerated or slowed this place down. We'd all finish up stuck to that wall. <laughs> but you're getting nowhere fast. You're just going round in circles. That's why the sun rose this morning and we'll go to bed tonight because we're just spinning round, getting nowhere fast, going round and round. And believe you me, after your funeral, it'll be going round. And you will have had no impression on it, whatever. So life is pointless. Old Father Thames keeps rolling along. It's been rolling along since the Romans came. And the people of London, I read this week, that when they drink water, they're drinking water that has already been drunk five times by five other people further up the Thames. <laughs> and old Father Thames keeps rolling along just the same. What about history? Let's turn, says this philosopher, let's look at history. The eye can never see enough to be satisfied and the ear can never hear enough. What does he mean? He's saying we're always searching for novelty, for something new. What's the whole package tourist industry doing? Showing people new sights, right? Sightseeing. And the more sights we see, the less satisfied we are. There's another place we haven't been. So we spend our lives sightseeing, going to a different place on holiday, and we never see enough. There's always something newer, we think, and we never hear enough that's new, do we? We pay a fortune for our newspapers, and you know, one Sunday paper is the same as the next. And it takes nine acres of forest to produce one issue of the New York Times, and there's nothing new in it at all. The wars have shifted from one country to another. The divorces have shifted from one film star to another. But there's nothing new. And they're called newspapers. And the ear can never hear enough. Sorry, Brian, I just caught sight of you. I don't want to put you out of business in that shop. <laughs> but you've seen it all, haven't you? You see it every day. The headlines, do they really change? Does the world really change? But we avidly read what we dare to call the news. It's as old as the hills. The only reason we think it's new is because we don't remember when it happened previously. Is this not true? History repeats itself is one of the favorite proverbs we have. Leon Uris, who became famous for writing the novel The Exodus, that story of how the Jews got back into Israel through the British blockade, has written another novel about the Irish. It's been at the top bestsellers, the top of the list of bestsellers in America for four months. 716 pages of overwritten something or other. And, and at the very end of this account of Ireland, of its history over three or four hundred years, magnificent survey of history, this is his final conclusion. There is no future for Ireland, only the past happening over and over again. That's his conclusion. There is no future only the past happening over and over again. And that was said in a book 3,000 years ago. Life is pointless. We're getting nowhere fast. Going round in circles. History is going round in circles. T Time magazine this week was reviewing a book on church history. And in it, the reviewer talked about what he called contemporary resonances. He said, if you think there's anything new in church history, it's all happened before. And he showed how it all had. He said, do you think hippies invading a church is something new? And he quotes something from the Middle Ages. He said, do you think the Lockheed bribes are something new? Look how the bishops established doctrine in certain countries of, of the world in the Dark Ages. And so he goes on. He just said, there's nothing new. I'm not, not much good at French, and I can't really pronounce this, but do you know the French proverb, 
plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. What's it mean? The more things change, the more they turn out to be the same. Apologies to all French-speaking people in the congregation. I can say it better in English. The more things change, the more they turn out to be just the same. Well, now, that's a pretty negative way to begin. Okay, so it's negative. It's true. It's where you've got to start if you're going to be honest about life. Now, the people I find who argue about this conclusion are those who are young, those who are ambitious, those who are quite sure they can make a mark on life, but it's not often that I find older people arguing with this conclusion. I'm speaking now about older people who have not found the answer to the question. And they would say, yes, that describes how I feel. Men in their 50s have come to me and said, looking back on my working life, I cannot answer the question, what have I achieved? What have I achieved? When I retire and get my gold watch and go, I won't be missed. Everything will carry on exactly as it was before. That's life. That's life for a man who's honest. The Bible shows here that you can go down path after path to the very end and you'll still come to a notice. No way. No way. The trouble is many people don't even think this far. Jesus criticized such people. He said, you're a fool if you only think in terms of what you can achieve in this life. You're a fool because this very night you'll be told to add up the accounts and you will have nothing to show for it. No profit. What shall it profit you if you've lived within this circumscribed framework under the sun and as long as I live? And if you've tried to make life worth living within that framework, you are doomed to disappointment. Will you learn from, from an old man? You willing to see this book of Ecclesiastes as a warning sign? Are you willing to listen to an old man speaking the truth about all the very things that some of you young people are trying, hoping that they'll bring you real life? If you're willing to learn, then you could learn a much more positive thing. Some years ago, I spoke to 40 young people. They were all Christians. And I asked them to write down on a piece of paper the one thing that had come into their life that they really valued more than anything else since they'd met Jesus. And out of 40 young people, 38 wrote the same word. That's interesting. 38 wrote the same word independently. Do you know what it was? Purpose. Purpose. Isn't that interesting? Here's an old man saying, pointless. And here are 38 young people saying, purpose. And the old man knows what is a solemn truth, that the majority of people who find the answer to the question, is life worth living, find it in their youth. Let me prove it to you. Those of you who feel you have found the answer to the question, is life worth living, the purpose in life, put your hands up if you found it under 25 years of age. Have I proved my point? That's why the old man writes to the young men. That's why he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the years come when it's too late. Find God now and you'll find life now. He's saying, I went all that way and I couldn't get life related to God. And the result was, at the end of life, my conclusion was, my life has been pointless. I've been going in circles, getting nowhere fast. So let me finish up. I keep losing my notes here. Totally lost. There it is. I want to finish by quoting Jesus and a man called Paul. Let me begin with Paul. A Jew from Tarsus, Saul, his original name was. And Paul once said this, he was as honest with the facts as Ecclesiastes and he agrees perfectly with what Ecclesiastes says. Listen, he says in Romans 8, the whole universe has been subject to vanity, to futility. Same word. The whole universe has been subject to this. Why? Because human beings are not fit to live. 
And it means therefore that God has built this into our universe now that the whole thing is going in circles. Everything is futile, everything is vanity, everything is pointless, everything is going round and round and getting nowhere fast. And it's God who did that to our universe. It wasn't like that in the beginning. When God made the universe, it was going somewhere. It was going in a line, not in circles. But it is God who has built in this futility to everything. Why? Because we are not yet fit to travel the road that leads to him. And so the whole creation is subject to futility. Waiting for what? Waiting for our redemption. Waiting for something to get put right in us. Waiting for us to be fit to live in the world. And then God will make the world fit to live in. And will create a new heaven and a new earth. And the new heaven and the new earth will not be going in circles. Be traveling in a straight line. Now, do you get the big cosmic concept here? You're beginning to get the overview? Do you see the thing whole? Life is useless, pointless, circular. It's getting nowhere fast, and your little life on this planet is doing exactly the same thing. And don't kid yourself, you're going to leave this world better than you found it. It's going to go on just as it was after you're gone. You've got to find out a purpose for yourself. And you will find it by reaching above the sun... And you'll find it by reaching beyond this life. And it's only when you reach out in space and forward in time, beyond the limits that our scientific world has imposed on our thinking, for our scientific and technological era teaches us to live within that frame. No wonder that in that technological era, art and drama and music are all saying life is meaningless. No wonder our culture is crying out in despair. No wonder we're getting sick humor. No wonder plays are coming out with no point, with no story. They are saying there is no point, there is no meaning. But the writer of this book did not take that position. He said there must be a meaning and I believe there's a God who knows that meaning. I just haven't been able to get through to him and find it out. But the Christian is someone who can say I have got through and I've discovered the answer. God did have a meaning and he did have a purpose and now I know it. And that's why a Christian could never write the book of Ecclesiastes. Not unless he wrote it before he became a Christian and was a very honest man who was willing to face facts. So look at some of the other things Paul said. He said a Christian lives not below the sun. He lives in the heavenlies with Jesus and life there is glorious. A Christian is actually living above the sun. Not under it, but above it. And he's basking in something much better than sunshine. It's a glorious life to live in the heavenlies. And you know, if you're not a Christian, you won't understand a word of what I've just said. You'll think I've gone crazy. But every Christian here knows, according to Colossians, which we're studying on Sunday mornings, that our life is hid with Christ in God. Therefore, if you're risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where he is, and you are. That's where your life is. You're living above the sun, not under it. Furthermore, we are not living in a life that's bounded by birth and death. We are already living eternal life that stretches through the grave and cannot be touched by death. So already there's a dimension that gives meaning and purpose and every action of mine today and tomorrow is going to count and going to leave its mark and will be remembered by God and by me. And that has given a whole dimension to life. I've got out of the circle and I'm now traveling a line or as a pop song in my youth, and this will date me, as a pop song in my youth, when I know where I'm going and I know who goes with me. Do you remember that song? Right, you're as old as I am, but <laughs> I know where I'm going, they used to sing. You never hear a pop song that says that now, do you? Songs now are just despair, trying to snatch a little bit of love now, because who knows? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's the conclusion he came to as well. If you don't know where you're going, then enjoy where you are as much as you can. That's all you can do. And that's sense. But now come back to Jesus. Jesus not only said, you fool, to a man who didn't think beyond the parameters of this world. Jesus also said, this is life. To know you, God, and to know Jesus whom you sent.
This is life. And if you read the teaching of Jesus, he relates life here and now to the world above the sun and the world beyond the grave. And once you get those dimensions into your thinking, you've found the answer that this man never did. And you say, life pointless? It has only got point now. I never saw the point of it before while I was rushing around that roundabout. Now I'm off the roundabout and I'm a pilgrim and I'm going somewhere. And I know where I'm going and I know who goes with me. Dr. Pearson, that great preacher, once said this, the key to Ecclesiastes is that a man is too big for this world. Do you understand what he was saying? You cut life off at the level of the sun and at the point of time, the grave. And you are too big to fit into that box. You stretch beyond it. You, your cribbed cabin and confined within it and you can't spread your wings. You can't live within that box. You may try and you may kid yourself for years that you're having a great life. But I warn you that you will get to the point where you say of whatever the scene has been, it's useless. Promises, promises. And then maybe you'll remember that a preacher once said that if you looked above the sun and saw God, and if you looked beyond the grave and saw Jesus preparing another life for you, you would see that life here is a preparation, a pilgrimage. It's leading somewhere. It's not leading to six foot under. It's leading to glory. And once you see that, why Monday morning becomes a different day. Life is going somewhere. Do you know this is death to the philosophy of evolution? And it's death to the optimistic humanist. That's why they hate this conclusion, life is useless, and won't face it. Those who believe that we're automatically, the whole world is evolving and getting somewhere, rubbish, it's getting nowhere, and God subjected it to that futility. We're not evolving anywhere. And I think in this last quarter of the 20th century, he's a bold man who would say the world today is a better day than when Ecclesiastes was written. Wouldn't he? Are there fewer wars? Is there less suffering? Can men get on with each other any better? It's just the same. And so Ecclesiastes picks us up by knocking us down. He says, follow your own thinking to its logical limit until you've realized that life is pointless. Then you are ready to listen to another preacher called Jesus who came to lift us above the sun and to give us life beyond the grave so that we could say life is useful. There is a point. I can see it now. Right, I'm going to do something now for two minutes. You can talk to each other about the sermon, all right? I want you to be quite frank and honest and tell the person sitting next to you exactly what you thought of the last three quarters of an hour. And you've got two minutes to do it in. Off you go.